All right. Let's go ahead and get started with the next session. Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, I'm Marty Johnson from AMD, and I'm my pleasure to introduce Jeff Beer. He's the founder of the uh, Embedded Vision Alliance, something that uh, AMD's been uh, interested in since the beginning. Um, we uh, we happen to be really excited about computer vision. We think it's uh, it, you know it's got a lot of potential for for the future, and, it, and it's also one of the greatest you know it's a poster child for uh, heterogeneous computing. So I'll turn that over to you. Thank you very much, Marty. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so now for something completely different, right? I think if you've been in this track, you've been hearing about uh, programming models and so forth, and I'm gonna just completely change gears on you and talk if about- I Whoops. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for telling me. Let, me. let me stop that thing from running so I don't have two running at once later. That would be bad. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna completely switch gears and talk about applications, talk about a class of applications that I call embedded vision or machines that see, which is uh, interesting, I think, for uh, three reasons in the context of this conference. One is, this is a technology that used to be a really specialized, expensive, exotic niche technology, like great for NASA, but maybe not for, for the rest of us. And that's now changed in a big way. It's now possible to put this kind of visual intelligence into almost any kind of product. That's number one. Number two, as I hope I'll... Uh, uh, convince you with some examples, by doing so, by kind of giving sight to applications and systems, we can make them much more intelligent and responsive and efficient and safe. Um, and number three, as Marty said, it, it fits perfectly with uh, heterogeneous computing for, and that'll be a main theme of my presentation, is kind of looking a little bit under the hood at these applications. How do they work? How do we get from pixels to insights about the world? What kinds of algorithms and data types and so on? And uh, what you'll see is that um, these applications are, as he said, they're really, they're really a poster child for heterogeneous computing. So that's what my presentation is about. My name is Jeff Beer. I am founder of the Embedded Vision Alliance. It is an industry association, about two years old, which was created to inspire and empower application developers and other product creators to harness this kind of technology in their products by providing technical education and building awareness. Uh, there are 35 member companies of the Alliance, including AMD, many other semiconductor, sensor, uh, tools, algorithms companies, and so on. I'll give you some links at the end of the presentation uh, about the Embedded Vision Alliance. My day job is running a small consulting company called BDTI that focuses on performance aspects of processors, especially embedded processors for digital signal processing intensive applications like vision. We do benchmarking and analysis, uh, and we also do uh, deep performance optimization of the algorithms on processors. So let me introduce, or just maybe not introduce, but, but uh, kind of revisit some important terminology for this presentation, starting with computer vision. Um, you've probably all heard the term computer vision, and the, the essence of what computer vision means is, it is it's this idea of machines that see. It means extracting meaning from visual inputs. There are plenty of systems that process visual data, like a digital still camera, for example, capture, store, transmit, display, enhance visual information, but they don't try and interpret, by and large, what that visual information represents. That's not computer vision. Computer vision is where we do try to establish, to extract meaning from the visual uh, information. That's, so that's what distinguishes vision from other kinds of image and video processing. Computer vision is a well-established field, um, over 50 years old. Um, and for a lot of people, it has this connotation of you know, bleeding edge research, very expensive, exotic technology. So we use the term embedded vision to denote something different, something more practical, um, something that's becoming ubiquitous in game consoles, in cars, in uh, television sets, in uh, retail uh, stores, and so on. What is enabling this transition from expensive, exotic niche technology to ubiquitous technology is, as is often the case in this industry, it's improvements in the hardware, first and foremost. If you think about what you need to make a vision system, something that extracts meaning from visual input, the essential things from a hardware point of view are obviously A, one or more image sensors, and B, some kind of a processor. 
that's going to run some algorithms that are going to somehow extract the information of interest from those fields of pixels. Sensors and processors, image sensors and processors, of course, have been impro improving at a very rapid pace and have really just in the last couple of years reached the point where now we can put sophisticated computer vision into even highly constrained consumer products, something that might sell for $100, something that might fit in a shirt pocket and, and run for a day or a week on uh, the charge capacity of a small battery. And that's fundamentally because of improvements in the sensors and the processors. There are many other aspects to what it takes to make a vision system, obviously, algorithms, APIs, software, and so on. But I think the thing that's changed the, the most in the last few years that's really enabled this technology to start to move quickly from niche to ubiquitous is improvements in the sensors and especially in the processors. And programmable, programmable processors are really essential for vision applications because the algorithms are complex and they tend to be constantly evolving. So unlike certain other visual-oriented applications, like let's say video, Encoding and decoding, where the algorithms are governed by standards, and they're relatively static. And so you can create hardwired implementations of, let's say, an H.264 decoder and get a really efficient implementation of video decoding by having dedicated hardware that does that and only that. It, that doesn't really work in vision, because in vision, the algorithms are constantly evolving, and they're not governed by standards. So we really do need programmable uh, processing engines. I'm going to talk about specific applications in a minute, but before I do that, I want to convey the idea that vision is really a very general, very powerful capability. It's kind of an intuitive idea, because you think about what you as a human being do with eyesight. It's incredibly varied, right? You can recognize somebody across the room, you can drive a car, you can thread, put a th you know, piece of thread through a needle, you can do so many things with vision. And likewise, machines can do so many different things through vision. And generally, I find many of them fall into these Categories, improving efficiency, like in factory automation um, or in energy management to turn things off when people aren't using them or looking at them, for example. Safety, uh, as in automotive safety systems, but many other kinds of safety applications as well. And user interfaces, improving usability, more natural kinds of user interfaces. And then there are many other kinds of things, and I'm going to show you one really cool example in a minute that maybe don't necessarily fall into these three categories. New kinds of things that we can do with visually enabled systems, visually intelligent systems that are uh, not possible to do or not practical to do otherwise. Another way to kind of think about the generality of vision is to recognize that the hardware components, the essential hardware components of a vision system, the sensor and the pro programmable processor, are very general components. And if you have those components in a system, like let's say smartphone today, every smartphone today has a powerful application processor and has one or more image sensors. The hardware is not specific to one particular vision function, like face recognition or gesture recognition. The hardware is very general. It's the software implementing the algorithms running on the processor that implements the specific functionality for the specific application. So in a way, a vision system like this is a software-defined sensor. It's extremely flexible, and it can be programmed to do lots of different things. The same hardware can be reused to do lots of different things. One great example that everybody can see and use today that illustrates this concept is smartphones. If you have a smartphone, chances are your smartphone was not designed with computer vision functionality in mind, because only a few of the very latest models come from the factory with certain things like eye tracking enabled. It, rather, your smartphone was designed with an image sensor to capture photos and video, and with a processor to do a whole variety of things, but not with computer vision specifically in mind. Nevertheless, you can go to your app store, and you can download dozens of applications that implement vision on your smartphone to do things like, for example, read your heart rate, measure your heart rate by looking at video of your face, or test your sobri check your sobriety by looking at an image of your eye, or recognize your face for purposes of unlocking your device, or recognize hand gestures for purposes of controlling your device. These are kind of aftermarket apps that use vision to add functionality to the device, even though the device wasn't designed with vision in mind. And so that kind of illustrates this concept of software-defined sensor. A lot of times people ask me, well, what are the real applications where people are shipping product and making money? And I'm not a market researcher, so this is not 
uh, rigorous by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I do sort of collect snippets of market research and anecdotal information. Uh, and from my informal research, the column on the left, these uh, six or eight applications, these are the ones which, which I believe are already multi-billion dollar per year businesses, factory automation, automotive safety, video surveillance, uh, military equipment, video game consoles, of course, the Microsoft Connect being the most famous example of vision in a game console, that product alone has generated over a billion dollars of revenue for Microsoft. So there are already a number of markets uh, where embedded vision is deployed that are serious business, that are billion plus dollar per year businesses and growing. And then over on the right are additional markets that I've seen that I think are really promising, but they're not sizable yet. So for example, there's a lot that's, that's starting to come to, together in healthcare, especially healthcare in the field, in someone's home or in a you know, kind of remote location where you don't have all the equipment that you'd have in a, in a hospital or a doctor's clinic, but being able to use something like a smartphone um, to capture images and interpret images either locally on site or send images maybe back to the cloud and do analysis there to uh, enable kind of powerful diagnostic capabilities. <clears throat> Let me show you one specific example of one of the coolest apps that I've seen recently. This is uh, an application or product from an Israeli company called Orcam. It's a little hard to see with this still. I'll play a video in a minute. But this woman is wearing a pair of regular eyeglasses and clipped to the earpiece um, is a small camera. The small camera is connected to a little device in her pocket, which in turn connects to an earpiece. She is visually impaired, and what this system does is it looks at the world around her, she looks at what she's essentially facing or looking at, it uses her finger to direct the focus of the system. So she can point at something like a street sign or uh, a, um, a, a piece of currency, and the system uses her finger to indicate as an indication of what she's interested in, and then it's, her, it's a visual interpreter that says, here's what you're looking at, but converts it into spoken language that she hears in her earphone. Uh, this is a product that's just started shipping in the last few months. Let me play you the video. Let's see if we can get the audio going as well. That's okay. I want to show you today how this device changed my life. Great, let's go there. Red light. Green light. Fifty shackle. Fifty shackle. Let's buy some coffee. Breakfast. Bagel plus coffee with cream cheese. Croissant. So imagine the difference if you're someone who can't normally read road signs, see traffic lights, read a restaurant menu, uh, tell the difference between a $1 bill and a $10 bill, of being able to just point and, and then have it you know, spoken in your ear. Pretty amazing. Um, according to Orcam, there are almost 300 million people worldwide who are visually impaired. I don't think I technically qualify, but I've gotten to the point where I like, can't read the labels on medicine bottles and whatnot, so I'd welcome a product like this for those purposes. Plus, imagine how great this would be if you're traveling somewhere where you don't speak the language, and instead of constantly fumbling for your, your dictionary, you could just point to you know, a street sign or a train sign or a piece of currency and hear the interpretation in your language in your ear. So I think it's a very powerful platform with, uh, with a lot of promise, not only for visually impaired people. At the end of the presentation, I'll give you a pointer to a website where you can see lots more examples of, of cool embedded vision enabled products. So I've said that improvements in the technology, especially the processors and sensors, are enabling embedded vision to really proliferate and enabling products like that OrCam uh, product we just saw, which by the way, the, the first production runs of, of I think a few thousand units are, are just shipping now for I want to say something about three thousand uh, dollars a unit. So it's it's early days, but it is in in commercial. Uh, it is a product that's in commercial production. Um, so it's it's possible, but that isn't to make these kinds of products. That is, it's possible, but that isn't to say that it's easy. 
these are, are really challenging problems. And I would just want to briefly highlight a few of the things that make them challenging and then dive into an example application to illustrate some of these ideas. Probably the number one thing that makes these systems complex is the fact that you have infinitely varying inputs that can be presented at the camera. Like imagine an automotive safety system with the camera looking out, often they're mounted near or behind the rear view mirror, looking out through the windshield, like this view. Uh, first of all, there's an infinite variety of scenes that you could see, but then there's also an infinite variety of conditions, some of them very difficult, like here we've got a dirty windshield and we've got glare. And that makes it very hard, for example, to see what's, you know, uh, road lane markings, for example. <clears throat> In addition, and, and so the fact that we have this sort of infinite variety of inputs and often very difficult conditions, poor lighting, low lighting, glare, shadows, and so on, means that it takes rather complex algorithms, sophisticated multi-layer algorithms to reliably extract meaning from these images. A further challenge is the fact that, unlike certain other fields, we don't have analytical mathematical models to guide algorithm development in vision. If we look at, for example, wireless communications, in wireless communications, we have really good mathematical models for how wireless signals propagate through spaces and reflect off of buildings and so on. And those mathematical models are very powerful because they enable us to mathematically derive what are the optimal modulation schemes and antenna pattern, radiation patterns and so on for a given wireless system in a given environment. And so we tend to converge on, you know, more or less agreeing on this is the right approach. With vision, it's too, the problems are too unstructured. We don't have those kinds of mathematical models. And so it's essentially an experimental field where we try stuff. We, we have an idea of what we think might work from experience. We try it in the lab on a limited set of test data. We refine things until it works. Then we take it out in the field and it breaks. We diagnose the failure. We go take, take it back to the lab. We expand our test data set. We refine the algorithms. And then we repeat that cycle forever. You're essentially never done with your vision algorithms. They, they are constantly evolving because of this infinite variety of inputs in, in many applications. And uh, the, the, the difficulty in having, you know, 100% accuracy in the face of those infinitely varied inputs. Relatedly, you have a lot of algorithms to choose from. Let's say you want to do face recognition. Uh, that's a common kind of vision function that has a lot of applications. Many different ways to do face recognition. How do you figure out, you know, if you're going to use an off-the-shelf algorithm as opposed to designing your own, how do you figure out which one to use? It's challenging, and it's made more challenging by the fact that each of these algorithms may have dozens of knobs, dozens of parameters that can be adjusted that change its behavior. Um, and so exploring that design space of algorithms and algorithm parameters, it can be very daunting and time consuming. Those are some of the key challenges from a design point of view, from an algorithmic design point of view. From an implementation point of view, one of the key challenges is the compute load. Vision applications tend to demand a lot of compute because they're usually operating on video data, which is lots, you know, high rate data, hundreds of millions of, of uh, data elements per second, typically. And like I just said, they're applying complex algorithms. So when you have complex algorithms applied to high rate data, you get high computation requirements. It, of course, the computation requirements vary per application, but tens of billions of operations per second is a typical compute load for uh, the kinds of applications that I'm talking about today. Now, if you have a rack with space for lots of processors and power budget uh, for lots of processors, then tens of billions of operations per second is no problem. But if it's something that's wearable or it's going to go in a pocket or it's going to be integrated into a rear view mirror assembly where it can dissipate almost no heat because it's going to bake in the sun, you know, in Arizona in July, um, then delivering those tens of billions of operations per second at very low cost, size, and power that's a big challenge, and that's one of the central challenges of embedded vision today. And that's where heterogeneous processors um, tend to come in, because if you implement the tens of billions of operations per second on pure CPU cores, you can do that, but it tends to be expensive in time, sorry, in uh, dollars, and in power, and in space. Um, if you want to get a very efficient implementation, often the way you do that is by using a variety of different kinds of processing elements not only CPUs, but GPUs, DSPs, and so on. <clears throat> and I'll oh, no idea. 
Okay, alpha particle. Um, sorry about that. And I would argue that many of the, the really interesting applications, like the automotive safety applications, are, the, are ones that are highly constrained. I mean, you might think automotive safety is not that constrained. You've got a whole car, you've got a whole power generator under the hood, but because of the heat dissipation issue, it turns out they are very highly constrained. And also they want to package everything very compactly, like in a little assembly that fits behind the rear view mirror, for example. The, there's an additional challenge about developer awareness and, and skills because most of the people who could be using this kind of technology uh, haven't used it before because it has been a very much niche technology in the past. So there's a lack of awareness and a lack of skills in most organizations that could be using vision technology. So those are a few of the things that make embedded vision a challenge today. Let me drill in a little bit more on the algorithms. Um, the algorithms, like I said, are very varied. Even for one application, like face recognition, you find a wide variety of algorithms. And of course, that just multiplies across a range of applications. But oftentimes, what you see in a vision application, when you look at the algorithm level, is a feed-forward pipeline like this, where one step, the output of one processing step feeds the input of the next, and so on, where we start with pixels coming in from an image sensor, and we end up with some uh, key information that we need, like, oh wait, there's a person in the road in front of the car, or that's the face we were looking for, or something like that. And when you look at how these algorithm steps work, oftentimes they can be divided into three kind of coarse categories like I've done here with the colors. The first steps in the process are usually involved with refining the picture, getting a better picture, so that the later steps have a better chance of finding the information they're looking for. So that could be something like, for example, removing noise from the image or improving contrast, or uh, reversing the geometric distortion created by a wide angle lens. These are algorithms that are, have to touch every pixel coming from the camera. But mathematically, algorithmically, they're pretty simple. It might just be a few mathematical operations per pixel. So the computation rates are high because we're touching every pixel, and that might actually mean every color component of every pixel. Um, but because the algorithms are relatively simple uh, and there's a lot of data parallelism, it lends itself very readily, these, these algorithms lend themselves very readily to parallel implementations on things like GPUs and FPGAs. Once we've improved the algorithm, uh, sorry, improved the image, then we start looking typically for certain kinds of features. What kinds of features depends on what the application is, but a feature might be a line, for example, an edge or a certain kind of shape, for example. And from uh, a collection of features, then we, we maybe look for a certain configuration of features to tell us that this might be an object of interest. For example, a, collection of, a certain collection of features might give us an idea that this region of the image is a face, or this feature is a, a lane marking in the roadway. So we go from dealing with pixels now to dealing with features. The algorithms become more complex. It's a lot more complex to figure out uh, uh, if, if a, a cluster of pixels represents a feature of interest, given variations in size, orientation, noise in the image, and so on, than it is to just do something simple like remove noise from the image. So the algorithms become more complex as we move from left to right, but the data rates go down very quickly, because now we're no longer dealing with pixels, now we're dealing with features. And whereas there could be 100 million pixels per second, um, there might only be a few thousand features uh, per second or tens of thousands of features per second of interest. So that really helps us because it keeps the computation requirement from exploding. Because algorithm complexity is going up, but the data rates are going down to kind of offset that. And oftentimes, also as we move from left to right, we get less data parallelism, less of the kind of SIMD, single instruction, multiple data parallelism that you know, can readily map onto data parallel engines like GPUs. And we get over to the right side, to the right end of the the algorithm, now we're dealing with very complex kind of decision making. We're trying to reason, not, no longer about features, but now about objects. For example, I'm pretty sure this is a face. Now I'm wondering if this face in this position in this frame is the same face that was in this position in the previous frame. I'm gonna use various kinds of calculations and statistics and heuristics, maybe machine learning, to make that decision. Is that the same face and therefore I have a trajectory of a person now, or is that a different person that just entered the scene? 
So here you get very complex algorithms. It can be hundreds of thousands of lines of code, but they're operating on even lower data rates. There might only be one or two faces in the frame, for example. So as we go from left to right, data rates go down. Algorithm complexity goes up. And also data types change, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. And so that starts to give you a flavor for why heterogeneous computing often makes sense, because the, the nature of the computation is quite diverse, even within a single algorithm uh, for something like uh, face recognition. Or uh, the example I'm going to use here is a simplified system for lane marking detection in a roadway. Um, you may have seen some of these um, vision-based driver assistance systems. A they go by the acronym ADAS, Advanced Driver Assist Systems. They've been shipping for several years on luxury brands like Mercedes and Lexus. Just in the last year, they're starting to ship now in mid-market models like the Subaru Forester, the Honda Accord, the Mini. This year are all shipping with vision-based driver safety uh, systems. So it's starting to hit the, the mainstream uh, midpoint of the market. And one of the features commonly implemented is what's called lane departure warning, where cameras look at the, the roadway markings and if the car is, is about to leave the lane in what seems like an unintentional fashion, in other words, no turn signal, no deliberate turning of the steering wheel, then it warns the driver, hey, maybe you're not paying attention, maybe you're starting to drift out of your lane. So obviously the key, the key there is to identify the lane markings in the roadway. And it sounds simple, but it's actually really complicated for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, plus the, re the fact that the lane markings are different in different jurisdictions, they're not always well maintained, et cetera. So let's look at a simplified kind of uh, flow of how you might implement a lane departure warning uh, system, lane marking detection system, to give you a little bit more of a flavor for these algorithms. Um, I mentioned that in the front end of the pipeline, the first steps are concerned with improving the image. And here, I'm going to talk about the geometric distortion correction step, um, which is a common, one of the common steps in improving the image. Especially when you have a wide angle lens or you have an inexpensive lens, you get this geometric distortion, which you can see in this image here, where straight lines in reality turn into curves in the captured image and vice versa. And of course, that can be, that can really wreak havoc with your algorithms, because your algorithms are going to be looking for characteristics like straight lines to infer things about the scene. So typically you want to reverse that distortion, that geometric distortion. And the good news is, Conceptually, that's not hard to do. Um, what you do is you take a calibration pattern, like this checkerboard pattern, that has known dimensions and geometry. You take a picture of that through the lens, and then you compare the locations of features, namely the corners in the checkerboard, in the captured image with the a priori known locations, correct locations, of those features in the checkerboard. And you see, you quantify the distortion. This thing that should be here is actually over here. This thing that should be here is actually over here, and so on. And you use that quantified distortion to calculate a set of coefficients that allow you to reverse the distortion, basically to warp the image back so that you get uh, uh, the true geometry of the scene by mathematically correcting the distortion. <clears throat> Uh, a, a very simplified way of thinking about this would be simply shifting pixels around, right? I take this pixel that should have been over here and I just move it over here. Unfortunately, you typically can't work just on pixels because you get too much distortion that way. You have to work at the sub-pixel level. So in other words, you, you have to take something that was at a pixel location and you have to map it to a new location that's in between four pixels in the output image. So that makes the math a little bit more complicated, but it's not terribly complicated. It's essentially bilinear interpolation and it maps really well into the uh, texture unit of a GPU, and it's extremely data parallel. So this is an example of a processing step that, while computationally demanding, because it has to touch every pixel and every color component, if we have a color image, every color component of every pixel, it's, it, it's ideally parallelizable. So if we have a highly parallel processing engine, we can get very good, efficient implementation. But you can see how we can easily get up here to maybe a billion operations per second. If we've got 100 million uh, pixel elements per second coming in, and we might, you know, we have to do 10 math operations per element for this bilinear interpolation, and it's on that order. It might be seven, let's say, but it's something on the order of 10. Uh, we're already up to a billion operations per second before we've even done anything interesting. This is just to reverse the geometric uh, distortion. So you can see how the computation load really grows. 
Okay, so skipping over other image improvement steps, now let's start talking about feature extraction. As you might expect, if we're looking for lane markings, um, a logical way, a uh, logical kind of feature to look for is an edge, a transition from a light region to a dark region, or vice versa. And so in this simplified lane detection uh, uh, algorithm, that's our next step, is to do edge detection, probably using an algorithm like the Canny edge detection algorithm, which is a classic edge detection algorithm. It does a combination of straightforward filtering, uh, finite impulse response filtering, with some kind of local feedback hysteresis control um, in order to try and minimize the number of false edges or spurious uh, or weak edges that are, that are detected. And of course, there are parameters that are, adjust, that are adjustable to help uh, to set appropriate thresholds in terms of what's a real edge and what's not. <clears throat> and so here we go from a grayscale image, for example, on the left to a binary image. On the right, the binary image representing just the edges in the original grayscale image. And this is a, another interesting example for heterogeneous computing, because this one algorithm, the Canny algorithm, contains elements that are extremely data parallel, like the FIR filtering is ideally parallelizable in a data parallel machine. But they also include some elements, this kind of local uh, hysteresis decision making that are really not very data parallel. And so in a classical heterogeneous compute situation like CPU and GPU, you would be in a bind here, because you'd have to decide this whole thing, the whole candy algorithm either goes on the CPU or on the GPU, it wouldn't be efficient to try and split it between the two because the overhead of moving the data back and forth would swamp any advantage you got. So you'd have to settle for a non-ideal implementation, either all on the CPU or all on the GPU. If you can leverage more modern architectures, more modern programming models that enable lower overhead in handing things back and forth between CPU and GPU, this is a perfect example of where that's really useful. So you can take just this one block and split it between the CPU and the GPU. After edge detection, a common uh, next step would be edge thinning, kind of clean up the edges and make them as uh, simple as possible, which will make life easier for the next step in the processing chain where we're trying to figure out which of these edges are actually lines, for example, for, for lane marking uh, that, that, are, that are then therefore candidates to be uh, lane markings. So this is a step we do in order to uh, make things easier for the next step of the algorithm and reduce the amount of computation required. And this is a binary morphology kind of operation. It's working on a binary image. Pixels are on or off. There's no grayscale. And it's looking essentially at the geometric character, uh, characteristics of clusters of pixels to decide whether to eliminate certain pixels uh, to create a cleaner uh, edge. And this is a case where this is an algorithm that is not particularly amenable to a data parallel implementation like a GPU because of lots of local uh, compute operations. So now we have this edge image that we've, where we've cleaned up the edges, made them kind of thin and, and, and as simple as we can. <clears throat> and now what we want to do, if uh, let's assume that we're interested in straight lane markings, because not all lane markings are straight, but many times lane markings are straight. So let's assume uh, for for purposes of this example, what we want to do now is find the straight lane markings. So we have a whole bunch of edges. That's what the middle image is, is all the edges. And now what we want to do is find a systematic algorithmic way to find among those edges where are the straight lines. And it seems really simple because for human, it comes completely naturally. We're you know, biologically programmed for such things uh, to be really simple, trivial for humans. But for machine, it turns out to be really complicated and to do this efficiently because there's an infinite number of possible lines in any given scene. And a common approach to this is something called the Huff transform. Huff transform, there are various flavors of it that can be used to detect different kinds of shapes, lines, circles, and so on. In this case, it's lines that we're interested in. And it's essentially like a voting algorithm. Imagine that the Huff algorithm, in this case, contemplates all possible lines in this scene. So that's all possible lines at all locations and all orientations. Obviously, that's an infinite number, so we have to quantize that space and pick just a subset of all possible lines that we're going to consider. Then it evaluates each line candidate to see how many of the edge pixels in the edge image actually fall on each line candidate, and there's a voting process. 
Each time an edge pixel falls on a line candidate, that line candidate gets a vote. And the line candidates that get the most votes are then most likely to be lines. And there's some thresholding process that decides which ones at the end of this processing step are considered lines. <clears throat> so then we wind up with something like the image on the left, where the red lines indicate the line, the line candidates that have been detected by the Huff transform. So we've taken that edge image, that binary edge image from the middle frame here, <clears throat> and we've detected uh, what we think are the straight lines. Now we're going to apply further reasoning uh, of, a, of a heuristic nature to eliminate things that are unlikely to be lane markings, like things that are up in the sky, right? Things that are up in the sky are unlikely to be lane markings. Things that are down on the ground are more likely to be lane markings. We might also use things like color. We, have, we know we expect lane markings to be, let's say, white or yellow, um, and we can use that information. So by applying various heuristics like that, we then reduce the lines to what we think are actually the lane markings, and that's now shown on the right image as red, blue and green. Green for the curb, uh, and a red for the, the, the center line, and blue for the, the parking lane um, boundary. And so you can see here, we're dealing with much smaller amounts of data. There might be, I don't know, 30 or 40 line candidates in this frame um, that they, we then distill down to three that we think are actually lane markings. So only tens of data elements per frame but they're complex data types, right? Each one is a line uh, that's characterized by a start point and an end point or you know, some other kind of coordinate system. And we go through a complex set of kind of heuristic reasoning to decide whether that line is likely to be a lane marking or not. So like I was describing earlier, the data rates have gone way, way down, but the algorithm complexity has gone way, way up. As a final step, we're probably going to do tracking of the lane markings from one uh, from one frame to the next. That helps with a couple of things. One is it helps reduce spurious errors, like if there's a sudden glare or suddenly part of a lane marking is obscured because a person walks in front of it or a car passes in front of it. If we're tracking things from frame to frame, we can build some inertia into the system and improve reliability, even though there may be some kind of spurious, uh, spurious characteristic to the data. It also enables us to predict, if we track from frame to frame, we can predict where we think where the car, the observer, is going to be in the future relative to the lane markings. And so we can predict, we don't have to wait till the car crosses the lane marking, we can predict that we think the car's going to cross the lane marking in three frame periods if nothing else changes, and we can take action based on that. So here we might use something like a Kalman filter, which is a classic algorithm for this kind of prediction uh, problem. Uh, and again, you know, we're processing very low data rates here, so this is something that would very easily run um, uh, even on a relatively low performance CPU. So I hope that that gives you a little bit of a flavor. This is obviously a simplified system, and please don't go program this and then rely on it in your car. This is a, a simplified example. If you wanted a robust system, uh, the algorithms would be much more complex, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a flavor for how in a typical embedded vision application, we go from pixels to insights about the environment and why heterogeneous compute is often the natural way to implement these kinds of algorithms if we're doing it in a constrained environment where we need to limit cost, size, and power consumption while still delivering lots of compute and lots of compute with a wide diversity of data types, data rates, and algorithm types. Um, I've been using the example of CPU and GPU because obviously uh, this being the AMD developer conference, uh, that's the focus here, but there are other kinds of processing elements that are used in embedded vision and heterogeneous processing. Um, here I've got an image of a mobile application processor courtesy of Qualcomm. This is uh, really, these are great examples of heterogeneous compute today. If you look inside a mobile application processor like this, you find multi-core CPU, you find GPU, you find DSP, one or more DSPs, and other kinds of more specialized processing elements. And in fact, um, if you look at what people are doing, the most sophisticated applications of embedded vision on mobile devices use all of the processing elements. They use the image signal processor at the front end, they use the CPU, they use the GPU, they use the DSP in a very carefully 
balanced, handcrafted way because they're highly constrained on power consumption. Right? You can write an application for a mobile phone that just uses all four two or three gigahertz ARM cores flat out, but the battery will be dead in 15 minutes. If you want an application that delivers that functionality with reasonable power consumption, you've got to find other ways of distributing the workload, and these other engines typically deliver more throughput per watt, for these, especially for these parallelizable portions of the algorithms than the CPU. So by pushing as much of the workload as possible off the CPU, often energy efficiency is improved. Um, and you know, again, not limited just to GPUs, also DSPs, FPGAs are used for, for this kind of uh, CPU offload, parallel processing, uh, and, and other kinds of more specialized engines. But of course, this brings complexity. With uh, heterogeneous processing comes complexity. We have to figure out, the developer has to figure out which processing, which portion of the processing load to put on each processing element and coordinate their activities. And that's, that requires you know, deeper level of thought and understanding than just running everything on the CPU. Fortunately, with the improvements that we're seeing in heterogeneous architectures, in tools, tool flows, and programming models, this is becoming a lot easier now than it was you know, even just a year or two ago. So I mentioned um, at the outset that I represent the Embedded Vision Alliance, and I hope that this presentation has piqued your interest in Embedded Vision such that you'll want to learn more. I would encourage you to visit the Embedded Vision Alliance website. The URL is here. It's embedded-vision.com, where you'll find tons of free, high-quality, technical educational content, uh, video tutorials, technical articles, free uh, tools download, tool downloads, and so on. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter there, and that'll keep you informed about our conferences. Uh, we run a, a very popular series of conferences. The next one will be coming up here in San Jose uh, in the spring. <clears throat> and uh, also, by the way, on this website, you'll find a section called, um, I can't actually remember what it's called, but it's under the resources tab that uh, has video clips of quite a few kind of leading edge vision-based products along the lines of that ORCAM uh, aid for visually impaired people that I showed at the beginning of the presentation. So to conclude, uh, embedded vision, we use that term to signal this transition uh, from computer vision, this exotic, expensive niche technology, to much more widespread practical use of uh, vision technology to create more intelligent, more responsive systems. One way to think about what adding vision to a system does is that it enables a system to know more about the world around it. And when a system knows more about the world around it, it can do a lot more, it can be more intelligent and more responsive. Um, it's improvements in processors and sensors, first and foremost, that are enabling this technology to proliferate, as well as programming models, tools, algorithms, APIs, um, and so on. And it really is a very nice match with heterogeneous processors. If you have a vision application that has to be mindful of resource budgets, power, size, cost. Often, I would say in most cases, if not all, a heterogeneous processor is going to be the way you're going to get the most efficient implementation. Obviously, initiatives like HSA that enable easier use of heterogeneous processors, therefore, are a really good match uh, if you don't have to become uh, you know, an expert at the bit level on how to map your workload into different processing engines with different tool chains for each engine and kind of low level coordination of data transfers and then a lot of overhead of data transfers, that's obviously a much better um, uh, environment for programming these kinds of applications. Oh yeah, eye-catching vision video clips. Here's the link I mentioned earlier um, and uh, some other links on the Embedded Vision Alliance site that you may find interesting. If you're curious about this technology and want to play with it a little bit, a great way to get started is this uh, executable demo package, the second to last link here. It's a Windows executable you can download and run in a few minutes on any Windows PC. You can plug in your webcam and it will run about half a dozen classical computer vision, embedded vision algorithms on your PC, like the edge detection algorithm that I described. Um, on real-time live, live, real live video from your webcam, so you can get a feeling by interacting with the algorithms how they work. 
there are also a simple, there's a simple user interface so that you can control the parameters of the algorithms and see how different parameter settings affect the algorithm's behavior. And each of the algorithms is accompanied by a tutorial article and a video that explains the math behind how the algorithm works. So that's a really easy way to get some hands-on uh, experience with how this stuff works without doing any programming. If you want to do programming, a great place to start is the OpenCV, Open Source Computer Vision Library, which is a very popular, large open source package. And we've bundled that up into what we call a Quick Start Kit, which is um, a virtual machine image that has all of the, the OpenCV uh, required tools already properly installed and configured. Um, so that all you need to do is download our virtual machine image download the free VMware virtual machine player, and it's as if someone magically came in and set up everything on your PC for you, properly configuring and installing all the dependent packages, and everything just works, rather than spending days of your time collecting all the various open source pieces and trying to get them properly integrated to work together. And that package also includes the source code for the demos that are in the executable demo package. So you can see how we built those simple demos for edge detection and face detection and so on. And you can hack up our source code to start playing with uh, creating your own applications using OpenCV. So these are some great ways to get started if you're curious and want to get hands-on with the technology, as well as the uh, articles and tutorial videos and so on on the Embedded Vision Alliance website. So on behalf of the uh, member companies of the Embedded Vision Alliance, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, I'd be happy to stick around and take questions if you have any questions. Thanks. If your company is a supplier of vi vision-related technology, processors, tools, and so on, and you're interested in joining the Alliance, uh, you can come see me or send email uh, to learn more about uh, joining the Alliance.